Valerie was asking, we had a, a question yesterday about um, defending yourself in your home. Say you have an intruder. Um, is it biblical to protect your family, even kill, in, you know, for the sake of that, that kind of thing? I think following from, on from that, Valerie was asking, uh, with culture changing, does it matter if it's um, a woman that can fight and the man uh, being weak, um, the woman fighting for the man, or is scripture very strict, that there are differences in men and women? Um, is it wrong if parents and children and husband and wives kind of change roles? Um, and even in workplaces, she sees a lot changing these days where employ you know, employees are challenging their employer and you know, there's a lot more kind of rights and things you can say and do. And There's a difference between rights and, and being ostentatious and rejecting authority. Right. Um, real quick aside before we get into the biblical aspect of this, something that really entertained me as far as history is concerned, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of the Greeks and Sparta, I know the movie 300 kind of popularized it, but it wasn't always slow motion and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. combat scenes and stuff. The way they structured their culture was really entertaining to me, not just because they were a militaristic and eugenics pro-society, but there was one thing that I found amusing about them is that when it came to, obviously, men and women's roles in that culture, and this is the crux of the question, if culture changes, then does right. social dynamics and morality change? And what was interesting was in this particular region of Greece, ancient Greece, mm. the Spartans had interesting family roles. They understood that women had babies. They understood that men were physically stronger generally than women. So there was an expectation of men to, of course, be a part of the military. And when the leader of Sparta would go out and conquer more areas, the men would be the ones at home or out and the women would be the ones at home. Mm. The men's military training, according to the historians we have, Herodotus being the primary one, stated that the training for men was around nine years old, but the military training for women was around 13. Mm -hmm. Now, that was unheard of, because in most cultures you wouldn't think of women being trained for military purposes, but that was actually intentional, because while the men are away, you assume Sparta is then vulnerable mm -hmm. because its armies are out. And that wasn't the case. The women were just as trained as the men. Mm. The only reason their military training came later is because in that earlier period, they were given the opportunity to learn things other than the military before civil defense. Mm. They would be the ones protecting their children. They would be the ones defending their borders. They were just as capable, much like the Norse cultures, where they had shield maidens and the Oskier and so forth. Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily a blanket statement. Women can't defend their homes and families. Many cultures recognize the capacity that if you have two arms and adrenaline, you can do <laughs> horrific things for the right reasons and yeah. in the right situations or in the wrong situations. But when it comes to the biblical question of, is it okay for such and such to do this? And then give the example of, I see in TV and movies. This is yeah. something that I try to take the time to address often in our student ministry as well. We play a game, this was encouraged by an internet apologist, but it's called Spot the Lie, where you see portrayed in fictional and fantasy settings that it's actually a good thing, that there are no consequences and sometimes even benefits to the sort of things that society and also, by extension, the Bible have regularly condemned and saying that's not the way you want to go. But if I determine reality on the basis of something fictional, that's a problem because that's not actually reality. And we need to be sensitive to that because in popular culture and entertainment, do I determine something as right or do I use the Bible as my metric in saying that's true and that's not? Now, if you're in a situation where you can defend your family or you're in a marital situation where you're more apt to defend your family, it's not A, an excuse for your husband to be a coward, that's the first point, but B, it's also not a note of shame if the mother wants to more physically protect her children while a husband would be more offensive in neutralizing the threat. We need to make sure that this narrative isn't saying because a man has to do something positive in this situation or ought to, a moral term, do something in this situation that's positive. The fact the woman isn't generally doing them is a condemnation of her, a demeaning of her, or saying because you have a different role in a family, that somehow makes you other than or lesser, whether it's the man or the woman, whether the man isn't home and the woman has to defend her family. Hey, 
The great equalizer is getting a gun. The point being made is this. When we're talking about or talking to people about issues, if the point of comparison, the illustration of the fact and point, the fact and point would be what? Is it always wrong for a woman to do roles generally assumed to be that of a man? The illustration, TVs and movies portray them as it could be a good thing if the woman would do this rather than the men. Well, now we're framing society on the basis of those show's writers, which may or may not be accurately reflecting reality. What we need to do is ask what actually reflects reality. What is our standard and what should we be doing in these situations? And the statement is and always will be walking in love. The priority that we set yesterday, of course, was that if we have the chance to live at peace among each other, mm -hmm. as much as depends on you, live peace among all men. Some people don't give us that option. If you're in a situation where you can defend your family, it's not a matter of, well, I'm a strong, independent woman, and I'm going to defend the family, and no man can tell me who I can and can't fight. Right. If he's a man, it doesn't matter if he's smaller than you. That was the point we made yesterday. He's going to want to protect your well-being, and I think you would be just as much in favor of that. But the point being made is this. Don't let TV, movies, entertainment be your authority or set the narrative because, as Peter, you're writing a book on this, it's inspiring. It's beautiful to you to see a woman in a position of power and authority and strength, even over a man, that that somehow makes it true. Because in Genesis chapter 3, what was one of the hallmarks of the fall of the woman's relationship with man, that there would be a desire to usurp and abuse one another. If you want a positive relationship, don't use the fall of man as your metric for progress in society. That'd be my opinion. Uh, Peter, anything you'd want to say in addition to or apart from what's been said, maybe even to correct? Uh, yeah, so we have to understand that there is a spiritual component as to why these particular things exist. So when we talk about gender roles, it's like, why do gender roles exist? There's a practical reason as to why the gender roles exist, and Sean alluded to it a little bit earlier, that even cultures that deny the existence of the true and living God, the one that we serve, and served different paganistic deities, they developed gender roles not to oppress women. So the modern day view is that gender roles were, were basically produced by patriarchal men who wanted to oppress women and wanted to get their way. The fact of the matter is that the gender roles were developed because they worked, right? In other words, people recognized, wow, men and women have different capacities. As Sean said, a lot of these are generalizations, but they do still have importance, right? It is important that generally men are stronger than women. And it is important that women have a role that can only be theirs, and that would be motherhood. And without the role of mothers within a society, the society collapses, right? And uh, I've talked about this numerous times in various sermons, but there's a lot of literature out right now that shows that the role of a mother doesn't actually end when the baby leaves the womb that the first couple months of maternal care, uh, especially, uh, the first two or three months of maternal care, especially for an infant, is so important that if you deprive a child of that, it actually has effects that will stay with them the rest of their life. It's, it's really radical, the studies that they've done. And uh, sometimes it's not even the woman's fault. So for instance, if a child is born prematurely and has to spend the first couple months in the NICU, they found that even those children are negatively affected by that deprivation of maternal care. So <clears throat> maternal care and nurturing for children, especially children under the age of five, is an indispensable resource. You cannot have a child be deprived of that and expect them to grow up in a societal way that they're going to be functional. Because of that, most societies recognize how important that role was and realized I was in the military. It's not very conducive to family life. You know, when you're in the military, not only do you have to actually deploy, you have to actually go fight, but you have to train a lot. And therefore, you're going to be away from your family for long periods of time. A child can function without a father figure for that amount of time in their childhood. It's not good for them, but they can. Being deprived of the mother is much more detrimental to the upbringing of a child. And so most societies structured themselves in a way where the mothers could be home providing that important care for their homes and the men could be away fighting. 
Now, that's all in a non-biblical sense. We just understand that these ideas were developed for a specific reason. These weren't all a bunch of evil men who got together and decided to deprive women of rights. There was a reason and a function as to why societies developed in the way that they did. Now, for the Judeo-Christian civilization, why did the Jews develop their society the way that they did, and why did the Christians develop the societies the way that we did? There was a theological component to it. So we recognize that while there is a, a benefit to divvying up gender roles in these particular ways, there is also a mandate from God in that the roles are reflective of God's nature. So when God creates man, you remember in Genesis, he creates Adam alone, and then he brings Eve out of Adam and then rejoins them together. And he says in Genesis 1 verse 27, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. What that means is that the masculine component of mankind and the feminine component of mankind make up two parts or two halves or two sides of God's divine nature. So it's not just one, it's not just that the masculine is reflective of God's nature, it's the masculine and the feminine. And therefore, mankind cannot appropriately reflect God's glory unless the gender roles and the gender distinctions are recognized and glorifying mm. to God. So when you look at the character of women, what are women predominantly better at than men? They tend to be more emotionally intelligent, therefore they become more nurturing, more compassionate. They tend to be also more agreeable. So women tend to get along a lot better than men tend to get along, right? And I could go on and on and on. There, there are a lot of components to femininity that are very, very important and naturally reflective of God. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul makes the distinction that women actually reflect the son, they reflect Jesus, and men reflect the father, they reflect mm. God the father. So when you look at Jesus's role, not only do you see Jesus performing these integrative roles within society, that Jesus comes near to man. He is the part of the Trinity that comes near to man and gets to know us personally. Uh, therefore, he has high amounts of empathy. He's described as a as the good shepherd, right? He carries the sheep. He has a nurturing capacity to him. Uh, it says in Isaiah 53 that he not only dies for us, which is, again, what moms do, they literally give of their bodies to support the life of their children. There's a sacrificial role of their body. Jesus gives of his body so that we can have life, right? And I could go on and on, right? There, there's a component of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that is reflected more clearly in the feminine than in the masculine. Uh, beyond that, the Holy Spirit also has an interesting reflective role of the feminine as well. So if you recall in Genesis, it says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the deep. I actually don't like that translation because the word in Hebrew is actually the word for brooding. Uh, not brooding as in being angry or upset, but brooding as in a mother hen brooding over her young, over mm. her brood. Sustaining it, literally. Right, sustaining like literally sustaining it. So some people are like, what the heck is the Holy Spirit doing there? Well, that's what he's doing. He's actually sustaining and nurturing the creative work of God the Father and the, and the Word mm. in order to bring it into creative function, right? The, the eternal feminine is present there in that moment of creation, which is really radical. And then when you look at the father, what does the father do? Well, what are men better at? Men tend to be more decisive. They tend to be less agreeable, which means that they are more confrontational and direct. They tend to also have higher levels of aggression. Uh, they tend to be stronger predomin uh, generally than women. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit more on the abstract side as opposed to the personal side. So in other words, most men are more thoughtful in the sense that they think about ideas where women are more into, interested in how those ideas affect relationships. Men are okay just sitting around pontificating about great theological thoughts mm -hmm. that have no implication for day-to-day -day living. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a frailty, but it's also a benefit that men have. Why does that matter? Well, God the Father is the head of the Son. He organizes and structures the Trinity in such a way to bring glory to God, right? So men tend to be the head of the the wife, right? They tend to be the head of the created order, order of God. That's why the majority of societies and cultures have men in leadership roles as opposed to women. Once again, this is not because all of these cultures are just like, well, women are terrible and we're going to oppress them. It was because they recognize men have certain qualities that make them 
better leaders, not all the time. And that's why, and this always surprises me, people are like, oh, these, these evil oppressive cultures. Why is it that when women do raise themselves to prominence militarily or politically, they're celebrated in these very same cultures you say are patriarchal and oppressive? Case in point, Joan of Arc, right? This is this is medieval Europe, right? This is not this is not your enlightened day. Why did people celebrate Joan of Arc? Is because they recognized, oh, this is really cool that she is feminine and she's actually bringing that into her role as being a leader, and that's yeah. really important and cool. Why or, is it that a third of the poetic Edis and Norse paganism are celebrating the exploits of the Valkyr? Why yeah. is it that the most prominent rulers in the northern realms? are, of course, those women who remained celibate after the deaths of their husbands and went on raiding and pillaging in his name. Yeah, and even in a, a, one of the most sexist cultures that I can name, uh, Islam, uh, it was Aisha, right? <laughs> the child, private of Ninety percent of what we know about him came right. from her. Came from her, and she was leading the battles of Muhammad into, I mean, the armies of Muhammad into battle after his death. Mm -hmm. So why is it that these, if they're so patriarchal and they're so evil and they think that women just are terrible in every single way, why are these women celebrated for taking on these roles in society that are traditionally given to men? And again, these are non-Christian cultures that we're citing right here. It's because everyone recognizes that the importance of women is not relegated simply to this traditional role, just as it's not, just as these same societies don't recognize in men that, oh, because you do this, these roles, you have no role in rearing the children. That's mm. not true. It's never been true. It's just our modern society has basically looked back at history and just condemned it because we're like, these people are ignorant, they're foolish, and they're patriarchal, and we're just condemning them outright. The without... only virtue is in victimizing yourself. Exactly. The only reason I have this role is because I can't have those roles instead of me having this role as an honor and serves a purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that, uh, you know, modern day psychologists, you know, whatever you think about the tradition of psychology, uh, they've actually done studies in the most liberated countries on earth, which would be the, uh, the Finnish cultures, right? Finland and Sweden and uh, places in that area, right? And in these areas, what they found is that women, when you take off all societal constraints and you allow women and men to do whatever they want, women dominate nursing and teaching occupations and men dominate more of mm -hmm. the leadership positions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now that's not societal imposition, that is people doing what they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. When you take off the societal constraints, people will naturally gravitate towards what they're good at, what they're competent at, and what they like to do. And so women are going to naturally gravitate there and men are naturally going to gravitate there. Now about one in five women is not going to do that, right? About one in five women is going to be more masculine and about one in five men are going to be more feminine. That's okay, right? There's, there's room for all. Like I said, some no guys one, like that. Yeah. In, <laughs> in the Bible, Deborah is not condemned for being more masculine. She's clearly a more masculine woman. She leads the armies of God with Barak in the book of Judges. She's not condemned for that. She's celebrated for that. Mm -hmm. Barak was um, condemned. Right. Barak <laughs> was condemned because, you know, you know, but, but you know, like you have, you have guys. And then there are also guys in the Bible that are more traditionally feminine. You have guys like, uh, for instance, Jacob. He preferred the company of his mom to his dad. You know, he hung out in the tents and learned how to cook. Right. He, was, and he wasn't totally a, a girly man, but, you know, he did have a more feminine bend to him and he's celebrated. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and David. David also had a, a highly feminine bend to his nature. He was kind of this interesting juxtaposition where he was incredibly masculine in the fact that he was a warrior, but he also wept openly in front of people. He wrote a lot of music. He was a, he was a poet. He was a harpist. Uh, he was incredibly sensitive. We see that in his writings. We see that in the way he behaves. And he had a, a really, really passionate way of loving people as seen even in his relationship with Jonathan. So uh, it's like, we don't look at these men and say that they're lesser because they kind of go against these uh, traditional roles. What we're saying is, is that the gender roles are for the spiritual purpose of representing components of God's nature to the world, which is what man is here to do. We are made in the image and likeness of God, which means that we have the role of reflecting his nature, reflecting the image of the invisible God to the visible created world order. Mm -hmm. And men and women have different capacities that allow them to do that at different levels. So what I'm not okay, I'm okay with someone saying, well, there's flex here. There's, there's flexibility in how we understand gender roles. There's differences in, like I said, temperament, which, which might allow for women to take on more traditionally masculine roles and men to take on more traditionally feminine roles. 
I'm okay saying that. Mm -hmm. What I'm not okay saying is, therefore, let's throw them out. Let's yeah. throw out gender roles because they serve no purpose other than to alienate people. I think that is missing the whole point as to why God created these things and even why, like I said, societies who don't even know God created these same types of orders within their societies. Yeah. So for, you know, for a family, you know, a married couple, they have kids, they decide the, the, the wife is going to continue in her career and the man's going to become a, you know, house husband. There isn't sin in that kind of setup, right? I mean, to me, my generation, that's yeah. still unusual. Right. You know, that's still, that's not the usual thing. Maybe, the, you know, younger generations, it's, it's kind of whatever these days. But, but there, isn't a, there isn't sin in, in them deciding, as long as it's not like Sean said, you know, I don't need to stay home. I, why should I give up my career? You know, a prideful, um, you know, kind of bitter thing. Right. There isn't, there isn't anything biblically wrong with. Yeah. And, and there are times where that happens. There are times where, let's say, you know, a couple gets married and they're looking at their finances. And let's say the wife happens to have a degree yeah. in which she makes she has the potential to make a lot more money for the household and the man doesn't. And let's say again that the man's temperament is the more nurturing one and the woman's temperament is the more aggressive and assertive one. Yeah. Uh, in those circumstances, it's not wrong for a woman to take on. It's not sinful. Uh, just like, again, it wasn't sinful for Deborah to do it. It's not sinful for the woman in those circumstances to take on the role. But there's a recognition, right? I think both the husband and the wife have to have a recognition of this is not how it 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 was designed to be, right? Yeah. God is making an allowance for our circumstances, but it's not how it... There's an ideal of femininity and there, there's an ideal of masculinity. Right. And we're going to try to meld into that. And as a marriage, marriage counselor, I'll tell you, it's one of the most difficult things that happens in a marriage, right? Some of the most difficult couples that I've ever counseled are ones where the gender roles are mismatched, right? So when the man is more nurturing and he's more emotionally intuitive and the woman is more assertive and aggressive, there is a huge issue in trying to reconcile those two points. Because mm. even though the woman is more masculine, I've never talked to any woman who's more masculine that doesn't have some level of resentment towards her husband for not being a man, quote unquote. Right. right. So the woman will start pushing him around because she's more aggressive. The husband will allow that to happen because he's more passive. And then the woman will denigrate him for being not a man. Yeah. And then the man will look at the woman and say, well, aren't you supposed to be emotive? Aren't you supposed to be compassionate and nurturing? You're cold. <laughs> you're, you're an ice queen. And then he starts to resent her for not having a, a, a compassionate side to her yeah. and sees her as being just, again, mean and cruel when maybe she's not. Right. So it's not that it's impossible to deal with that mismatch. I'm just saying that it's difficult because of how God created the dynamic. Uh, so it, overcoming it is tough. And, and if you're going to take on those different dynamics, remember that there's going to be something in you that's going to buck against that. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something in you as the woman that's going to look at your husband and maybe resent a little bit that he's not contributing to the home as much as you think he ought. And for the husband, you might resent your wife a little bit for not allowing you to, even if it makes more sense financially, uh, not allowing you to kind of pursue whatever goals and ends that you have for yourself career-wise. Mm. So, you know, be very careful. Just be cognizant of that. Those are things that can be overcome, but they're going to be present. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. And probably even things that first attracted you to that person. Yeah. You know, that the man was emotionally intelligent and sensitive and those kind of things. Right. And then they grow to resent that. And they're like, well, be a man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you liked me because I'm more sensitive. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. yeah it, absolutely. But that's good. Being aware, of, being aware of those things, that's really good to be aware of those those kind of roles. Well, great. Anything else, Sean, to, to add to that? No, we'll no? just summarize what's been said. There are examples in history and in different cultures of men, women, men and women having and fulfilling different roles. We don't determine exceptions by the rule. If we look biblically and note gender roles, it's not to oppress, but to give equal opportunity. Don't victimize yourself because you're given a opportunity that someone else has. And then ultimately, when it comes down to the purpose of gender roles, it should be to glorify God, right. not to diversify your portfolio. Yeah, yeah, very good. 